Now we turn to the Gospel account where our Lord quoted from that psalm that we read earlier, Psalm 22, and we're going to take up our reading from Matthew 27, from verse 27 down as far as verse 50. Matthew 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. Now as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, place of a skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there. And they put up over his head the accusation written against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. And now our text. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We'll continue our reading. Some of those who stood there when they heard that said, This man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Amen. If Sam could please bring the announcements at this point. Well, welcome everyone to our service uh, this morning, and if you're visiting with us, uh, you're especially uh, welcome. Uh, our evening service at the usual time of 7 p.m., but as usual at the minute, uh, it's not here. It will be uh, a YouTube uh, service. Uh, now, for, Jeff is going to be on holiday uh, for a number of weeks, and during that time, we'll continue as we have done uh, for the last few weeks, there'll be a, a service here each Sunday morning and there'll be a recorded message then for the Sunday evening and that, that will continue on for the next uh, number of weeks uh, while Jeff is on holiday. Next Sunday, uh, our service in the morning here at 11.30 uh, and Daniel will be taking that uh, service for us and the evening service uh, again at 7 and it will be a recorded message that Jeff is going to uh, record. Jeff mentioned in his prayer that the, the uh, explosion in Beirut and the fact that uh, there's a MRF facility there. So we had a, an unofficial uh, deacons meeting this morning and we're going to send a gift of £500 uh, to MRF uh, in Beirut. Just one other announcement and it's a, with great pleasure to turn to Mark and Chloe and uh, next Saturday is the big day. And can I just say on behalf of the whole congregation, we're delighted for, we, uh, for you. We hope you have a great day. 
and we trust and pray that God will bless you as you set up a home together. And we live in a society that is in great need for Christian homes, and we're delighted to see another one uh, being set up. So may God bless you richly on the day and every day afterwards. These are all the announcements. Let us pray. Let us turn to God in prayer. Father, we do pray for Mark and Chloe at this time. You know all about the circumstances. We do live in very unusual times, and it's, it's not at all normal to have a wedding in a back garden, but we acknowledge your sovereignty at this time, and we just pray that you would go before them. We pray that everything would work out really well. We pray that everything that is done on that day will be to your glory and praise, and that uh, Mark and Chloe might remember it for the rest of their lives. Grant us your blessing, we pray, and grant us good weather on that occasion. And Father, now as we turn to these most solemn words, speak to our hearts and help us to see that without Christ, we are totally undone forever and ever. But through him, we are blessed with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. Hear our cries now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Over the centuries, there have been many strange cries arise from earth to heaven. One of the strangest was the cry of the blood of an innocent man, Abel, slain by his brother. Scripture says, the voice of your brother's blood cries unto me from the ground. The cry of Hezekiah was equally strange. God told him that his time was up, that he was to set his house in order, for you should surely die and not live. And that godly king was so overwhelmed that he could hardly pray. In fact, Scripture says, like a crane or a swallow, so did I chatter, I did mourn. As a dove. But the Lord heard that strange cry and extended his life by 15 years. Jonah's cry was perhaps even stranger. He disobeyed the Lord and was put in the fish's belly for a sin, and from that strangest of all closets, he prayed. And God heard him. Out of the belly of hell cried I, Jonah said, and you heard my voice. However, there is one cry in Scripture which dwarfs all others in both the strangest. Strangeness and mystery. And it is this fourth saying of our Saviour on the cross where our Lord cried out, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? John Murray says it speaks of the most mysterious experience that ever transpired in this world's history. And it describes the most mysterious plaint that ever arose from this sin-cursed world. And eternity itself will not reveal a stranger and more anguished cry than this. The story of how Martin Luther was deeply impacted by these words is legendary. This is what Krumachter said about Martin's response when he heard these words. We're told he continued for a long time without food and sat a wide awake, but as motionless as a corpse in the same position on his chair. And when at length he rose from the depth of his cogitation as from the shaft of a mysterious mind, he broke into a cry of amazement and exclaimed, God, forsaken of God, who can understand it? Personally speaking, I believe that the moment described here is the most mysterious moment in the history of the world. Our text is not only the fourth and the so-called seven sayings of the Saviour on the cross and therefore the central one, it is also the central point in redemption. If you were to depict the history of the world using the imagery of a dartboard, this would be the bullseye. Because everything in scripture points to this moment and everything else flows from it. Because if this moment had not taken place, heaven would be empty of human beings. In other words, it's impossible to get closer to the heart of salvation accomplished than the transaction described here for us in these words. And for that reason, there's a sense in which this text is almost unpreachable. Who is sufficient for these things, we ask? However, since the things revealed belong unto us and to our children, we're duty-bound to examine them. But I confess with you that all I can do with regard to this text is to paddle with you in a notion of infinity. Four things then from this text. First of all, consider with me the darkness God caused. The darkness God caused. Caused. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. Let me remind you again of the circumstances. Our Lord had already been on the cross for three hours prior to this. 
Mark 15 verse 25 says it was the third hour and they crucified him. The third hour is 9 a.m. in the morning. And from then until 12 noon, our Lord hung on the cross up to this point. And during that time, several things happened. First of all, the religious leaders and those who passed by scorned him. Then the soldiers gambled for his garments. And throughout that parade, our Lord uttered three of his seven so-called sayings on the cross. He uttered his word of forgiveness. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He uttered his word of salvation to the dying thief. Today you shall be with me in paradise. And he also uttered his word of affection to his mother. Woman, behold your son. He was saying to John, take her away and look after her. But then at noon, when the sun is normally at the highest point in the sky, something extraordinary happened. Everything became dark. Luke says the sun was darkened. Now we may be able to relate a little bit to this experience because we passed through an eclipse a while back. But there are the parallel ends. We knew what was going to happen because it had been announced on the news, but this scene was entirely unexpected. Furthermore, the eclipse we experienced only lasted for a few moments, but this one lasted for three hours. So for a time, nature itself seemed to sympathize with what was happening on the cross. There was not only an eclipse in our Lord's soul, and we'll come to that later. Nature itself reinforced that message by undergoing an eclipse as well. And it's interesting to note that Scripture doesn't record any scoffing or taunting by the people or the religious leaders throughout that three-hour period. It seems that the darkness, sadly, temporarily, only shut their mouths. When God spoke in a language all his own, the language of miracle, they were silenced, but sadly only for a time, because tragically the taunting returned after the, after the light returned. Look at verses 47 to 49. Some of those who stood there when they heard that said, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it in sour wine and put it in a reed and offered it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. How depraved man is. After this amazing miracle, the people were still taunting and mocking. Now, there's a very obvious question we need to ask here. What is the significance of this darkness? Here are three suggestions. First of all, perhaps God was saying that the goings-on here were so solemn that he deemed it inappropriate for human beings to witness them. Sometimes if there's a piece of news on television which is particularly gruesome, we turn it off so as to protect our children from distress. And this scene here was so unique that it seems God himself cast a blanket of darkness over it. The transaction taking place was so awesome that God concealed it from prying eyes. I suspect that is part of the reason for this darkness. God was saying the goings on here were so solemn that he deemed it inappropriate for human beings to witness them. But then there's a second reason for this darkness. Perhaps God was also stating that this event was bound up with the future of the earth. Now presently there's something not quite right about our world. Genesis 3 traces that problem back to the entrance of sin. And that impacted the earth itself. Thorns and thistles appeared. And because of that our world has been under judgment ever since. And the Apostle Paul likens the, the, the world at present to a woman travailing in childbirth. We know that the whole creation groans and travails in bondage until now. So Paul is making the point that the, the cosmos itself longs for something better than it is presently experiencing. And that something better has been purchased by Christ at the cross because through his death he reconciled all things to himself through the cross. Paul says right into the Galatians. And this cosmic side to Christ's death will materialize at the end of time when God ushers in a new heavens and a new earth. So the new heavens and a new earth is the product of Christ's sufferings. And it's just possible that God intends us to connect these two things, the judgment of Christ and the judgment of this world, so as to remind us that there's a cosmic side to Christ's death as well as a personal one. So as we ask about the significance of this darkness, perhaps God was saying that the goings here, goings on here were so solemn that he deemed it inappropriate for human beings to witness them. Perhaps also God was also stating that this event was bound up with the future of the earth. 
And then thirdly, but there's no perhaps about this because we can absolutely be, be absolutely certain about this. Thirdly, darkness supernaturally wrought is a symbol of divine judgment. And let me now prove that to you from other portions of scripture. One of the plagues was a plague of darkness. This is a symbol of the judgment of God. Exodus 10, verse 21 to 23. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, darkness which may even be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Here's a couple of verses from the book of Amos again, which brings together these two things, darkness and judgment. Amos 5, verses 18 to 20. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. For what good is the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. Or as though he went into the house, leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light? Is it not very dark with no brightness in it? And some further words from chapter 8. Verses 9 and 10. It shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon. And I will darken the earth in broad daylight. We don't have to travel too far from our text to discover that, do we? I will turn your text into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth in every waist and baldness in every head. I will make it like mourning for an only son and its end like a bitter day. And of course, in addition to these references, our Saviour also described hell as a place of outer darkness. It's impossible to escape the connection between darkness and judgment. And this is what God is saying here. He is reminding us that this transaction is inextricably bound up with his judgment upon sin. And what's more startling is this. The one undergoing judgment is the light of the world. What an anomaly. The light of the world being plunged into an inky black darkness. And comparing scripture with scripture, it's also extraordinary to reflect on the fact that when Christ was born, there was light at midnight. Shepherds were abiding in the fields that night, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. But exactly the opposite happened here. When Christ died, there was darkness at noonday. We're talking here about something absolutely unique in the history of the world. So there you have the darkness God caused. Secondly, the trust Christ exhibited. He cried out with a loud voice saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Our Lord had now been on the cross for six hours. And as the period of darkness drew to an end, he uttered these words, which display his amazing trust in his Father. The words, my God, my God, remind us that we're talking here about something very personal. It's interesting to note that prior to this, our Lord had always addressed the Almighty as Father. Holy Father, he prayed in the high priestly prayer. In Gethsemane, he addressed him as Abba, Father. And even when he was initially put on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. But now he addressed the Almighty as God. And why is that? Well, again, this is a perhaps. But perhaps he used this term so as to emphasize a sense of God forsakenness. Remember that this is the only time in the history of the world that the communion between the Father and the Son had been interrupted. So perhaps Christ used the term God to emphasize the breach that had occurred. Or to put it differently, his sense of intimacy with the Father was now so radically altered that he spoke of the Almighty as God rather than his Father. But yet throughout this breach, our Lord's faith was remarkable. It was my God, my God. In the midst of what we might call his unknown sufferings, he still owned the Almighty as my God. And this is undoubtedly the greatest example of trusting God in the dark that this world has ever seen. John Flavel has pointed out that Christ spoke 
Two words of faith. Whereas he only spoke one word of complaint. My God, my God, that's faith. Why? That's the word of complaint. And of course David predicted this in the psalm that we read earlier. Psalm 22 verse 8. Speaking of the Messiah, he said he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. And the crowd spoke these words in mockery. But unwittingly they were acknowledging the amazing faith of Christ on the cross when he cried out, my God, my God. So the words, my God, my God, remind us that we're talking here about something personal. But the word why reminds us that we're talking about something absolutely horrific. This is not the way of inquiry. This is the way of wonderment. Our Lord could easily have articulated this why theologically. He could have told you exactly why he was doing this. He would already spoken about this moment on previous occasions. For instance, in Mark 10, 45, he said that the Son of Man did not come to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. He always knew about this moment and he predicted it. He spoke about going to Jerusalem to suffer at the hand of religious leaders on several occasions. And of course, what was the cup in Gethsemane? But a preview of the sufferings that lay ahead. So our Lord knew very well the answer to the question, why? He knew why he was going through this moment. But you see, it's one thing to predict what is going to happen and to speak about what is going to happen, but it's another thing to be caught up in the midst of it. And now that this terrible moment had arrived, our Lord expressed his feelings with this way of wonderment. The word, my God, my God, reminds us we're talking about something personal. The word why reminds us we're talking about something horrific. And the phrase with a loud voice reminds us that we're talking about something glorious. At the end of it, he spoke with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. The word for loud that is used here is one from which we get the English word megaphone. Do you remember school sports day in the past? You never had any problems hearing the master of ceremonies, did you? Well, that implies that the sound of our Lord's voice here on this occasion would have been very loud and would probably have shaken his hearers if you think about it. You see, crucifixion was such a debilitating death that it greatly affected the ability to breathe. It sapped the physical strength to such a degree that it would have been very difficult to talk, never mind shout. Yet here, after six hours, our Lord did not utter a muffled groan. He shouted. He'd already spoken several words in what appeared to be a normal tone of voice prior to this. But here he shouted. It was as if he was saying, I am in control of this. I am the Lord, even as I hang on the cross. Here we have the trust Christ exhibited. Remarkable example of faith. But then we have the abandonment Christ experienced. And we now come to the heart of this amazing verse. As I've said already, I can't think of stranger words found anywhere in all of Scripture. Sometimes the word forsake is used in a readily understandable sense. As for instance in the expression, Demas has forsaken me, having left this present world. Doubtless that hurt Paul greatly. But that word there is used in a normal sense. And it doesn't even begin to describe what happened here. Because here on the cross, amazingly, God the Son was forsaken by God the Father in human nature. And as Luther said, who can understand it? Now let me now attempt to explain what this means. And I first of all want to begin by saying what it doesn't mean. Note three things. First of all, this strange phrase does not mean that the Father didn't love the Son at this point. Because this is part of the mystery of Calvary. The father never loved the son more than he loved him at this moment. Never. Now that our Lord's obedience was reaching his peak, the father took more delight in him than he had ever taken. Precisely because of his obedience. Scripture says that. John 10, 17. Therefore does my father love me because I lay down my life. John Murray again says, this love of the Father was at no point more intense and exercised than when he was enduring a substitute, the cup of unrelieved damnation. So this 
phrase does not mean that the father didn't love the son at this point because he loved him more than ever. But then there's something else that it doesn't mean. Nor does this text mean that Christ wasn't supported by the father at this point. Because again, another part of the mystery of Calvary is this. Our Lord could only endure this abandonment at the hands of the father because he was supported by his father. Now, I can't get my head around that. But that's what scripture teaches. Because how did Christ endure this? He was upheld by the Father. Behold my servant whom I uphold. And in that prophecy the Father promised to behold the Son. And that was why he was able to endure this terrible moment. John Flavel puts it like this. Though God deserted Christ, yet at the same time he powerfully supported him. His omnipotent arms were under him. Though his pleased face was hid from him, he had not indeed his smiles, but he had his supports. Strange, isn't it? And then thirdly, and again negatively, this phrase does not mean that there was any change in the divine essence at this point. How could there possibly be? God cannot change. So whatever happened here, Christ did not cease to be God in any sense of the word, nor was his position within the ever-blessed Trinity in the slightest bit threatened. Amazing as it may seem, and it's hard to get your head around this, I confess, but at this very moment, when he was abandoned by his Father, Christ was still controlling the world, because by him and through him all things are held together. Let's now consider the phrase positively. And I'll say two things. First of all, At the very least, Christ was saying here that for the first and only time he lacked a felt awareness of the Father's love. Throughout all eternity, Christ had never been bereft of his Father's love, not even for a millisecond. The Father had always lifted up the light of his countenance upon him, but now he hid his face from him. And even though Throughout our Lord's human existence, he had always enjoyed the blessings of God's common grace. That was even removed from him. The sunshine is a blessing of God's common grace, but that was even taken from him at this point. And he hung somewhere between heaven and earth as if rejected by both. Again, quoting John Flavel. He said, apprehend reader, this was a new thing to Christ, and that which he was never acquainted with before. From all eternity until now, there had been constant and wonderful outlets of love, delight, and joy from the bosom of the Father into his bosom. He never missed his Father before, never saw a crown or a veil upon that blessed face before. This made it a very heavy burden indeed. The words are words of astonishment. My God, my God, thou who has never forsaken me before, has forsaken me now. So as we think of this, The meaning of this phrase in a positive sense, at the very least, our Lord was saying here that this was the first and only time that he had ever lacked a felt awareness of God's love, of the Father's love. But of course, the full meaning of this abandonment as interpreted by Scripture elsewhere is this. When our Lord uttered this cry of abandonment, he was declaring to all and sundry, that at that moment he was experiencing the unmitigated wrath of the Almighty God against sin. Interpreting Scripture with Scripture, that is what this cry of abandonment meant. Throughout our Lord's life, he always sustained a certain relationship to the sins of his people. From the moment Herod sought his life shortly after his birth, right up to the moment when he was nailed on the tree, he was always our substitute, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. However, as you know, his sorrows increased dramatically towards the end. In the garden, he trembled at the prospect of drinking the cup, but here he actually drank it to his very dregs. And this mark, this cry of abandonment marks the climax of our Lord's sufferings. Prior to this, he had stood before the high priest, before Pilate, before Herod, but now he was standing at the bar of his father's justice. That's what this cry of abandonment is all about. And both his body and soul, our Lord, was now undergoing the terrors of the Lord. So as to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
Never think of Calvary primarily in terms of our Lord's physical suffering, terrible as that was. It was this cry of abandonment that was at the heart of Calvary, not the mere act of crucifixion, terrible as that was. As someone has said, the sufferings of his soul was the soul of his suffering. And it was at this point that Christ came into contact with the infinite wrath of God against sin. And that's what lies behind this cry of abandonment. To go to Isaiah 53 again, we did to see him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. Let me illustrate it a little differently. Do you remember immediately after the fall, God placed cherubim at the east of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life? That was God's way of saying that we're cut off from life because of sin. If we are to have access to that tree of life again, someone needs to deal with that problem of the flaming sword. And Christ did that right here. In fulfillment of Zechariah's words, awake my sword against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow. That's the essence of this cry of abandonment. As Rabbi Duncan put it, he bore damnation and bore it lovingly. Here are a couple of other quotes from different theologians, one by Smeaton and the other by Spurgeon. This is what they have to say about this text. Smeaton says, He bore the soul trouble that his people might not bear it. He drank the cup of the garden that they might not drink it. He was forsaken on the cross that they might never know desertion. He felt what sin is and what it is to be severed from God that we might never taste it. And he proclaimed with a loud voice the inconceivable agonies of that desertion that he might convey to those who heard him or who should afterwards pursue his, peruse his sufferings to the end of time a due impression of the infinite weight of sin and of the penal desertion it entails. Or as Spurgeon said, Here is my only begotten son, my other self. He takes on himself the nature of these rebellious creatures and he consents that I should lay on him the load of their iniquity and visit in his person the offences which might have been punished in the persons of all these multitudes of men. And the father says, I will have it so. Or we could simply summarize and say, he stood in our stead. The darkness God caused. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. The trust Christ exhibited, my God, my God. The abandonment Christ Experience, why have you forsaken me? And then lastly, the response God demands. What are we going to do about this? Friends, how are you going to respond to this mind-boggling moment in history? We are all sinners and we deserve God's judgment, but in his great mercy, God has opened a way of escape for those who believe in his Son. And what was happening at Calvary? At Calvary, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. But have you received that reconciliation? The future of every single one of us falls into one of two categories. God will either deal with us through Christ or outside of Christ. Those who put their trust in him are accepted in the beloved scripture says there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. However, God will deal in strict judge, justice with all those who refuse to bow the knee to Christ. And what do you face if you die outside of Christ? Listen to these words of Nahum. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can abide the fierceness of his anger? It's one thing for Christ to endure the wrath of God. But it's another thing for you to bear it or anyone else Christ is God and he could endure the billows of God's wrath and rise gloriously again from the dead furthermore because of the uniqueness of his person and his work and the value of his sufferings they can extend to a great multitude of people but it's very different with us we are only sustained by a frail human nature and our sufferings are not of infinite value therefore if we die outside of Christ God deems us just for us to suffer eternally if we don't trust in the Son. As our Lord himself said, he that believes in the Son is everlasting life, but he that believes not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him continually, forever and ever. And that wrath is depicted graphically here in this cry of abandonment. Is it any wonder, Scripture says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? 
But there's obviously an application here for believers as well. Because surely this cry of abandonment should provoke profound thankfulness for our so great salvation. Every believer can say the Son of God loved me and give himself for me. And this cry represents the pinnacle of that love. Greater love is no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. And that's what our text describes. So this text should constrain us to be profoundly thankful for what our Lord has done for us. But it should also constrain us in another direction as well. It should provoke us to good works. We love him because we first, he first loved us. And how do we love the Lord? The love that we show to the Lord is more to do with obedience than warm, fuzzy feelings. Because scripture says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all. This is where a consideration of Christ's love should lead us to. To be profoundly thankful and to walk in the ways of new obedience. So as to summarise, as we look at this text, we behold both the goodness and the severity of God. We behold God's goodness towards those who trust in him. Because he was abandoned, they will never be abandoned. But we also behold this severity in this text. Because this text forces us to ask the question, could we endure this anger of God against us? The good news is we don't have to. Because the moment we trust in Christ, God says, although I was angry with you, my anger has been turned away. May, it all, may this be so for all who listen to this sermon for God's own glory and for our good. Amen. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, both now and forevermore. Amen.